Well, my friends, uh, for this episode of Wizard, Witch, and the Wild One, we always like to start out with a little bit of a recap because episodes can be so long. So if you're tuning in to just the recap, we do cut this out and put it as a separate um, video on YouTube. Uh, So if that's where you are in the description, you can find the link to the whole episode discussion, which we'll break it down and talk about what we loved about it, what we think about it. So having said that, um, this is episode 10 of The Wizard, the Witch, and the Wild One of the Reaching Green. The episode is going to open up with Ursulon, who's just finished uh, recovering Naram's sword, Wavebreaker, from um, Will Gallows. And he's proudly, um, somewhat drunkenly, making his way back to the Chantry, uh, where he goes back to his room and uh, finds a bottle of wine before falling asleep in a chair. Uh, Notably not falling asleep in a bed, a little detail of our spirit friends. Um, We also jump over to Suvi, who we find out, although she's been told to do nothing till Steel arrives, uh, she's unable to sleep in the governor's mansion and ultimately decides to head back to the Chantry as well, where she finds her room, the door off its hinges, splintered, broken into, and finds a note from Ame, who had come in there to talk to her, (laughs) uh, basically saying... Hey, I went after the fox. He's going to go see Orama. And this note is sort of like thumbnailed, um, or it's not an expression. It's placed <laughs> in it's placed in a section of the book that talks about Naram's the gifts given to Naram, including Wavebreaker. Suvi sees this, freaks out, rushes over to Ursulon's room, wakes him up, and is like, we have to go. Like, shows the book. And it's like, we, ha- we have to go. Um, and then she's like, wait a second, you have Waybreaker. Like, what happened? And her salon is very proudly like, yeah, Will Gallows likes me. He thinks I'm a big deal now. <laughs> um, but despite that, uh, Suvi's like, all right, well, we got to go help um, Ami. We have to go after her. So they get up and they rush out into the dark of night to help uh, Ame and recover the fox. Ame, meanwhile, is um, heading to the edge of Port Talon and is asking the fox, hey, where are you? And the fox is like, the fox gives some directions as a fox would, like follow the rabbit trail, and it's not helpful at all. But ultimately, the fox is pretty unwilling to help because the fox is worried, hey, if you find me, you're going to make me come back. And like I'm keeping to his last episode line, I'm going to have you do what you really should be doing, what you want to be doing. Um, So Ame continues, she stows away in the back of a wagon that is carrying uh, the witch fire, I think the salt or something to that effect, yeah. out into the area outside of Port Talon. And once she's out there, it is effectively a barren wasteland. Um, Brennan describes just the entire earth has been desolated by this witch fire and there's no green in sight. Um, it's so smoky and difficult to breathe that she actually puts on one of the um, witchfire um, veils, I think is what it was called, yeah. uh, before finally ducking out of the wagging, wagon and heading into the um, kutzu that is growing up outside of this um, burnt area. And uh, the kutzu, I'll just call it sort of the kutzu forest or jungle, because Effectively, um, everything has been overtaken. She can't find any sign of like old buildings or even like life in the sense of um, Brennan describes this kutsu as being so thickly overgrown and in some cases 40, 50, 60 feet tall. Uh, meanwhile, um, Suvi and Ursuline also make it to the wall. They get there and they're like, well, maybe, like, aren't we just allowed to leave? Like, why do we need to like stow away in something? So they go up to the guards. And they're like, well, let's actually have some kind of cover. So Ursula's like, hey, my pregnant wife, uh, or pregnant, my pregnant sister wants to go back home to, I think it was Lambry or something like that, and um, to recover some like old family heirlooms. And the guards are like, first of all, it's three in the morning. Like, why, why are you guys <laughs> leaving at this time? And second of all, I hate to say it, but Lambry is totally gone. Like all of the city, everything outside of the city is totally gone. Um, there's this back and forth of like the guards being like, I can't like, like rightfully let you leave. I mean, be very wrong of me. And Ursula's basically like, Hey, can you at least open the gate so she can see the desolation and realize there really is no hope. So they open the gate and then, um, <laughs> Suvi just decides to just, uh, 
run for it. And so she just starts <laughs> full speed running out of the gates. Um, the guards are like, what are you doing? And Ursula's like, I'll, I'll go after her. I'll, I'll get her back. And so he runs out to, and the guards are like, what is happening right now? Um, again, three in the morning. Uh, but they basically make their escape into the katsu. Um, I will say that Brennan has them do um, some constitution checks because they haven't slept. They haven't got a full night's sleep. And the travel to the shrine is a day and a half's journey. Um, so they're actually asked to make a roll. Suvi, um, either, I can't remember, there's a couple of rolls. I think at one point she's given advantage, and then another point, Brennan says, you know what, you don't even have to roll. Because her military training, she would be used to this kind of like arduous travel. Uh, Ursulon has a, rolls poorly and gets a point of exhaustion, actually. And as they go into the Ketsu, he's actually going to grab onto some of the Ketsu and try to commune with Orima. Uh, Orima is pissed, um, is like, who the heck are you? What's going on? Um, what's happened to Naram? Um, very much furious and angry. And Naram, uh, excuse me, Ursulan is like, uh, yeah, um, I couldn't do anything. There's nothing I could do. Like Ursulan was, was out of luck. Um, or rather, it, pe the people were too powerful for me to help. And Orima's like, too powerful like what do you think what do you think i would do if if um you know if i got involved so it's like that's a good point and orma orma basically says you know i i'm looking after i'm going after ame and i want you to bring me wave breaker the sword as sort of like a an apology for not doing anything we cut back over to ame who the katsu has grown over so much that it's blotted out the sunlight and um it's around this time in the darkness that she hears these creeping these creep these creatures essentially like these wooden dendrite-esque creatures that come up from the earth from the katsu and she basically hands herself over to them these minions of orima who bind her and drag her off presumably towards the shrine uh, and that is where we go to a quick ad break before coming back to the second half. Do you want to take it from there? Yeah. Um, you guys you couldn't hear it because I was muted, but my fire alarm started going off. That's why I got up at the, uh, during your segment there. It's no but. problem. And it's also coincidentally where I looked and realized I wasn't recording the recap. So. <laughs> nice. <laughs> really really um, good at that. <clears throat> But yeah, so I, it was a false alarm, but if it happens again, I apologize. I'll, I'll mute as soon as I can. But yeah, all right. We pick back up um, after the break with Suvi and Ursulan still just trekking through. <clears throat> and Ursulan actually asks for Suvi's staff uh, to assist him as he's walking because he is just struggling. Um, Suvi, in addition to this, also reaches into her pack and takes out some of this moss, which is seemingly like Citadel-like a ration or something yeah like it's like adderall or, or like speed yeah, yeah. or something she describes yeah. it as like something that can keep soldiers like going through long marches and stuff um <clears throat> or it at least has that placebo effect so ursulan tries some of that um and they keep going uh we cut back to ame who is communicating with the fox again um and he says you know he's waiting for her <clears throat> but when the fox finds out that she's being like dragged by these creatures, he like immediately is like, oh, what the heck? And he's very upset and like takes off from wherever he is, presumably to where he thinks she's going. Um, we then cut back to Suvi and Ursulan. Um, oh, but before that, actually, uh, Brennan has Erica roll for pack integrity and she uh, loses an item. So this is some sort of mechanic, um, but she says she loses the seashells that she collected from that first coastal town they were in. Um, <clears throat> so cut back to Ursulan and Suvi. Again, Ursulan is just really struggling, but they actually run into the fox, and I think the fox is eating like a dead rabbit or something, and Ursulan is like, give me some of that. Um, so they both start eating. Like a um, long decomposing rabbit. Yeah, or something. it was really <laughs> gross, but Ursulan was, you know, he was about yeah, it. At the point. <laughs> <laughs> so they all group up, and at this point, they're going to make their way into one of these kudzu like thickets. Um, they make their way in, come to a shrine, and they basically, I think Brennan describes it as they've kind of passed through a doorway unknowingly, like through all this overgrowth. <clears throat> and it is indeed the shrine to Orima, and uh, laid before it, 
before it is Ame's unconscious body. And Brennan lets her know that you've she's essentially gotten a long rest um, as she's been placed here. Uh, and the fox immediately runs over and wakes her up. The group then begins communing with Orima, essentially. And Ame apologizes for everything that's happening to her and Aram. And she just says she wants... To I want to speak for you in this conflict. Like, can I be your, your messenger? And Orima accepts. And she says, <clears throat> Ame says that she will help set things right. But please, like in return, could you spare the city? The people, like they didn't know what was going on. They had nothing to do with this. I'll, I'll teach them the ways. I'll remind them the ways we will come and keep your shrine clean. But Orima isn't having it. And, um, she is very angry, very upset. And she blasts her salon for being, more human than wild one at this point. And uh, she lets him know that you will never truly be human either. Like you're lost between these worlds and you've forgotten yourself. Uh, even citing specifically that he's lost his breath. And she asks, what have you put your breath into? And Ursulon shows her the pauldron that he got um, from Sir Curran. And kind of in the reflection of the pauldron, a scene can be seen of a young Ursulon and Sir Curran approaching him and giving him the pauldron and Orima asks like what is this did you give your breath to this man <clears throat> and Ursulon says not the man um but what he was uh honor and Orima finds this funny she's known some wayward spirits in her time but none that tied themselves uh up in a knot quite like this uh, and she does not envy him Ame says that in her mind there's no tension with what Ursulon's going uh, going through uh, between the two worlds that he's a part of. He still treats the world of spirits with respect and he has honor. Um, and it's not something that you attain once honor. It's something you maintain in how you treat others. And Ame thinks that Ursulon lives this way. So he should still be able to walk the path of the spirits while doing so honorably. And Orima asks her, how many people do you know that have ever truly walked any path honorably? Uh, and she cites that Ursulon has woven a great spell, and although it might not strike your kind heart as just, woven it is all the same. <clears throat> In any case, you've come all this way with my husband's sword. Whatever, whatever binds him, it can cut, but it can only be wielded by a spirit. Only one who draws power from their breath. So Orima asks Ame to bring her into the world by taking the offering at the shrine and scattering it. And Ame's like, well, hey, if I do that, are you going to have mercy? <clears throat> and there's like an insight check that happens here and she rolls pretty low. But Orima says that her goal is to free her husband. She bears no cruelty toward the innocent people of the town, but also no care for them as they have done nothing like to help Naram. She says she would not be a fool to make a promise to a witch she didn't intend to keep. Um, but so she says, again, my goal is not to harm them, but I am mighty. And so what harm comes to Port Talon as a result of this it's not my desire, but it would be a just punishment. Um, and an interesting thing to note as this conversation is happening, uh, Suvi actually starts to speak during one of the breaks in conversation, but Orima just instantly continues as if not hearing her at all. So uh, Orima says, if you do not let me free, then I, I will not let you leave this place alive. And that's where the episode ends. Uh, again, episode 10 of the Wizard, the Witch, and the Wild One. And if you would like to hear our full discussion, it'll be linked down below.